Hey guys, welcome to another Shenmue Dojo video. I hope you're doing well. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the scope of Shenmue 3 and whether it was potentially too big for the budget that it had. So, sort of going into the whys and why nots, I mean, Shenmue 3 gets a lot of shade thrown in it for all sorts of reasons. Some of it is definitely justified. The story content absolutely is the, the one I think we all agree on. Some of it isn't. Uh, people claiming it's unplayable. Just go and watch the Digital Foundry video on Last Hope and then tell me that Shenmue 3 is unplayable because it isn't, honestly, it really isn't. But one thing that I've always wondered around the criticisms and the things that have been said around the game was, was it too large? Was the scope too large for the budget that they had? Now, I will always, always applaud the ambition of Shenmue 3 and what it managed to achieve with the budget that it had, despite the, the issues that have been described. We got two awesomely detailed worlds, fully voiced NPCs, and some awesome conversations with Shen Fa and other things in between. But quite rightly, it was been criticised a little bit around the story content. And I'm just sort of asking the question here is whether the scope for the money they had was too big. I'm not criticising developers. I'm not criticising necessary decisions. I'm just asking from an analytical point of view, did, was this potentially too much? Anyway... Let's sort of dive into this. So before I go into the main sort of nitty gritty stuff here, I wanted to sort of just give some caveats here. Where possible, I've got facts and figures that are out there and available publicly. Uh, in some areas, I've had to make assumptions based on what is out there and then my best guesswork. So I will try and sort of highlight those to say, yep, that's a bit of guesswork on my part. They could be incorrect. There could be something that I've missed. I'm absolutely happy to be corrected and guys if you have any input on this you know do drop us a comment below and i'll pick some up as we go so let's sort of dive into some facts and figures and impacts here we know shenmue 3 had a overall budget eventually of 20 million dollars which was funded via the kickstarter and and paypal slacker backer should be your productions deep silver wise net and it is believed there was a small amount of money put in through sony as well nobody knows how much and again with all the breakdowns here the only categoric figure we know is the shenmue 3 kickstarter finished at 6.333 million um, obviously increasing up to around seven ish million once the slacker back campaign had finished so the rest of it essentially is split between deep silver shibuya um, wise net sony whatnot so for argument's sake i will say that they deep silver put in 10 10 million dollars just for the benefit of this video i don't know this but it's just an easy number for me to work with and then it leaves essentially 10 million dollars from the kickstarter shibuya and everybody else so the kickstarter as i said ended at 6.333 million dollars fantastic achievement um, it would have lost 25% of that to Kickstarter and the shipping. So already you're then down to $4.75 million left. Marketing budgets are typically around 10% of budget. Um, I'm making the assumption that the 20 million figure here uh, included marketing. I don't know this. It may not have done, but I'm making that assumption here. So roughly speaking, they had 16.25 million dollars for everything overall now that seems like a lot of money but remember this was not a static budget deep silver came along at gamescon 2017 and there was money sort of trickling in through the slacker backer so that instantly makes things quite difficult to plan so pre-production could have been challenging around this they may have had to plan for several different scenarios maybe they didn't predict the changes in the budget and what the impact of this might have been um so there's, these, there's already an overriding factor here in terms of how this thing was being put together. And just for argument's sake here, once you've taken away um, all the budget for Kickstarter uh, and marketing, they probably had, before Deep Silver, around $8 million to fund Shenmue 3 in core money for a humongous project. So that's pre-production, production, production polis polishing up, and post. So that's a massive 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 scope here of, of project um and quite frankly that's where the question comes from is it too big so let's talk about the original kickstarter idea and 
where this sort of massive scope came from before we then sort of dive into the budget and how it was used and what we got. So in terms of the original Kickstarter idea, we were going to get three areas. We were going to get Bailu, uh, Niawa, also now in Chobu, and Baisha, which we know what happened to that. Interestingly, in the Kickstarter, Baisha was first in terms of the stretch goals. And just to make the point on that, I'm going to bring it up on the screen for everybody now just to have a look at. So these are the stretch goals here, um, which detailed the various things that you would get as the Kickstarter raised money. And as you can see here, uh, what looks to be $4 million, uh, the Baisha stuff starts kicking in. So mini games, infiltration, additional quests, battle event. Uh, then you then talk about character perspective system as well, which is a separate system that I will talk about later on as we as we sort of dive into this. So we had three areas sat there. So that's one big thing. We then obviously then talk about building a fighting system. We then talk about the character perspective system, which was talked about at length through the Kickstarter and then further on as well. And then you talk about your music, you talk about all the other systems that are essentially going to be put into place for for this game to exist so that's quite a big thing you also with the battle system as, as i just popped this up in my head they were going to go for a skill tree system um so when you think of typical rpgs that's you get a skill learn another one it branches off if you think like horizon zero dawn or horizon forbidden west is, is one example assassin creed is another they were looking at that sort of system and then you've got to build all the things around that make shenry special you've got to build the world the npcs you've got to voice it you've got to do like, like all the other bits and pieces that are put together and as you hit the stretch goals you're then looking to implement those so like ragdoll and AI, ai battling was put into that as well so then before Deep Silver came into this, this is you had about $8 million to fund this thing. So to fund three areas, NPCs, voiceovers, battle system, character perspective system, build worlds, build systems, build all of that. That is a humongous scope for what isn't a massive amount of money in game development terms. $8 million is not a lot. Obviously, we know Deep Silver came in and sort of made that thing better and gave more money, which then led more to stretch goals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, being being met. And it's interesting they talk about um, sort of resourcing and how it goes into. So then, bringing up another update, which I'll be putting up onto the screen right now for you, uh, from one of the Kickstarter updates, and this is update number forty-four. Um, so this is not long after the Kickstarter's finished, so August 31st, 2015. They talk about the planning phase here. So this gives us sort of a very brief idea of how that's going to look. I'll make this a little bit bigger for everybody so you can see it. So this is essentially the development process. You start your composition, your outline, your story, your project plan, and then your real-time renders, events, battles, etc. So the game flow, all this section here, which is just question marks everywhere. And then you've got the end bug fix and tuning, etc. Let me make that a bit better so I can see that. There we go. So then they talk about a little bit of the composition stage, how it's going to look. Um, and they f they feel they can't finish just one chapter in one region. So they've had to restructure the story to fit within the scope of Shenmue 3, which is interesting. So they're already thinking about the story and how that might have to change. They've had to re essentially rethink the storyline, writing additional stories and making other changes. The planning part, um, they talk about here, and it's quite brief. They say they... they They've, they know the amount from Kickstarter campaign. We can plan the overall budget for development. So I've mapped out the game project to fit the budget scope at this stage. Now, at this stage is interesting. So they were obviously thinking they might get some more funding. But it looked like they'd at least thought about how they might scope this thing out. Now, with scope and project planning, you can plan, but things happen, things change. And you can just get it wrong at the end of the day. So they may have gone, we've got the X amount of money. We're going to go this way, this way, and this way. And it doesn't quite work. And they have to rejig, refocus, replan. And there, and there you go again. So then it then talks a little bit about uh, some other plannings as well. So like how they planned like the, the, the story, etc., the cutscenes, events, battles in order. And then they're going to dive into game development. And that was in August coming into September 2015. So they definitely had 
a plan of some description of how this thing was going to essentially work. So at this point, they would have probably been thinking, right, we need to put in the skill tree, we need to put in the character's perspective system, we need to build three areas, we need to put all the stretch goals in, and then we need to get this thing made. Now, Baish is interesting in this factor, and I, and I bring this up for ep update number 47, which I'm also going to pull up for everybody to have a look at. So this is update 47, and it talks a little bit about the planning phase and the map testing. So interestingly, they've got Rio with some black suits here doing some battle testing. Now, this second image here is particularly interesting because it looks like it's set in a Tulu. So that says to me, now I could be wrong, but it says to me that Baisha was in the early stages of development. And we also know from a tweet that we put out a while ago, which also was on the Gamer's Journey uh, video, that um, is a promotional video, in fact, that you see a very short, very, very short pre-production phase of a Tulu and Rio running outside it. So Baisha was 100% in development at some point. How far along it got, we do not know. There's a little bit more about conversation testing, they then started testing the thatched, thatched roofs for, for Bailu, which you know, that could possibly pass as LDS house, actually. And it just moves on into some other bits and pieces as well, which are not particularly relevant to this video at this point. So Baisha was there, all this big planning, and then they got into development. And what happened? Well, first off, they were getting money through the door very sort of slowly through the slacker backer, which is one thing. And then they got the publisher which was a good move in the sense of it hit more stretch goals. But most of these were essentially mini games and jobs. And this brings us into essentially what we got in the analysis of what we got. So let's look at the stretch goals that we actually ended up achieving. And it's, it's great we got these, don't get me wrong, but it's an interesting point here. And they obviously had to make decisions based around the Kickstarter versus other content. So just park that for a minute. And then I'll go into this bit here. So this is a much later update. This is from 2017. It's oh, 2019, in fact. Let me get myself right. Um, so this is really near the end of things here. And they confirm what's come into the game. So you've got the original stretch goals here. Uh, they note that skill tree system has been changed to a skill book system, which was fine. They've noted here, Baisha has become the fortified castle area, but everything got put into it. That's interesting. I think, personally, the mini games got moved to Niawu slash Bailu. The infiltration mission, well, we know what that was. That's the castle. The additional quest was the three item quest. And the battle event was likely, in my mind, the, sort of the battle up to the castle to fight Landy. The character perspective system has been canned, um, but I'll come on to that in a minute. Uh, you've got Portuguese language, great. Uh, you've got some more battle system, ragdoll reaction, some AI battling, which obviously came through from the um, from not just the Kickstarter, but also the Slacker Backer. And then we're into some other bits here. We didn't get the high ground battling. That doesn't matter, but they were, mostly, um, they were actually mostly flat. But you did get some nice environmental damage stuff, which was quite cool. Uh, you've got your mini games for Chobu, Niawu, betting games, got more of those. Kung Fu Mastery, for me, this is Grandmaster Bay and the reverse body check. Part-time job, that's got to be the forklift in. And then you've got your Bailu stuff, which is essentially very similar with the Kung Fu Mastery being based around uh, the the section with Grandmaster Sun and learning the body check, which I know gets criticised um, because it isn't too dissimilar to what you learn, obviously, in Niawu. It is a different move, and I do wonder slightly whether they did that to save a bit of money in terms of mocap, just change a hand position or something like that. Um, but but who knows? I, I understand the criticisms of, of that one. So essentially what we got here is they did scale this thing up. But how difficult was it for them to scale this thing up? Now, my theory has always been around Shenmue 3 that we got the bare script without the things in between due to the stretch scope and resources. Now, I'm going to talk about this more in a second. When you go back to the original Kickstarter, they talk a lot about the things that make Shenmue special. The world, the characters, everything. So Shenmue 1 and 2... Essentially, the story beats are fairly straightforward from A to B to C to D. 
but it's the things around it that really enhance it, that really bring it to life, especially in Shenmue 2, with some of the character arcs there. They are fantastic. We don't quite get the same amount of it in Shenmue 3. There are some of it. Um, the Shen Ha conversations are amazing. Uh, the, the, the setting with Grandmaster Feng was really good. Remembering your father. Um, the Grandmaster Sun stuff was quite good. And there's some little tidbits dotted around the game that give us a glimpse of it. So they obviously try to balance this out with other priorities. The character's perspective system ended up being scrapped. Um, though we do know time was spent on this. Uh, Shen Musing's found in his um, sort of digging around the files. He found unused dialogue text for Ren in Bailu Village. So that's really, really interesting. That that seemed to be a reasonable way down the line. And then they canned it for whatever reason. Was it not ready? Was it not going to fit the story? Was it going to be DLC? Who knows? But it didn't make it. So you've got all this extra funding, right? And instantly people are going to be thinking, what can be done with this thing? So it, it, it's, a, it's really, really difficult because in traditional methods, I think you may have found that during production, they could have gone and gone, oh, the budget isn't quite going to make what we think. We need to refocus this and re, you know, maybe drop something. Who knows? With the Kickstarter and stretch goals that they've said they've made, they're sort of tied. They're sort of tied here. So they, they, they want to implement these because that's what they've promised. So you end up in this, this really tricky situation of have you bitten off more than you can chew with the stretch goals and, and balancing that out with the story content? Or have you essentially made sacrifices elsewhere to try and get things it's really tough how what do you do what do you do there as, as a develop, developer when you start realizing things aren't quite going to stretch as far as you thought they did but you've got these promises from kickstart it's very public very very public so you have to balance this thing out and go right what can we do how can we get the store how do you bring that together that's a really tough call for them to make and one i quite frankly would not want to make so then comes into i think the crux of this this video and the analysis and and what i think was the budget too little for what they wanted to do now my straight answer to this is likely it's a yes and that is not a criticism of anybody um i applaud ambition i am and absolutely applaud what they did with shenmue 3 despite some of the issues that we know it had the world building in Shenmue is needed. It's one of the biggest things in Shenmue. It's what makes it special. It's why we fell in love with, with the series, among other things. So it would have required a lot of time and effort to get this system, get this game made. We know from Ryan Payton, 70% of the time was spent on the systems and getting this thing together, which if you put that into figures, now this is before Deep Silver become involved, so you had that 8 million figure, you'd have had essentially $5.6 million spent on your system building, your world, bit, all that sort of stuff, leaving $2.4 million for everything else. That's including your story, including your voiceover, including your motion capture, which they had to do at WiseNet, remember? They didn't, ha they didn't hire this out. They didn't have the benefit of, of, of the VF system, Sega's facilities, and all being done in-house. They had to do it themselves. So that's a lot of money gone not leaving a huge amount of money for anything else for ease if you double these figures obviously they end up with 11.2 million on on systems 4.8 for everything else which i know again sounds like a lot but five million dollars to build the story do the voiceover is it is it enough was it enough i personally don't think it was so there's then the question here, and then this comes into, like I say, to the Kickstarter and essentially the promises they made. Should they have focused on one really detailed area and then something on the end of it like the castle or Baisha? And there is absolutely an argument for it. Now, when I interviewed Ryan Payton, I was more in the camp of I wanted as much Shenmue as possible. Ryan was was discussing this with me and said if you get what well, yeah you can focus on one more one detailed world 
it can be more polished, etc., etc. And that is a point I take. And having thought about it longer term and thought about this in hindsight, I do tend to agree with him. And he made a very good point. But we had the tie of the Kickstarter. And that is critical here. The tie of the Kickstarter and the promises that they had made. So let's then go back to the original Kickstarter and look at the stretch goals that we achieved at the time. So this is what we achieved at the time. Various language support, fine. The rapport system, which we obviously got to some description, but not quite there. The skill tree system changed. Your mini games, etc. as well. So there's a lot there that they promised and were tied to. So they probably felt that they had to put this in. If we then go over to the update here where they've essentially implemented all of that plus some extras here from from the other uh, money raised and then the mini games here in terms of the stretch goals they've gone for they've obviously gone well that's what we were working towards that's what we're going to put in but i'm wondering whether they would have been possibly better served essentially putting that money into bailey village and a castle but would there have been an issue in terms of if they lost Niawu, bearing in mind we actually lost Baisha as well, how would that have been reacted to? Would Kickstarter backers have accepted that? I don't know. I wouldn't have a problem with it personally because it may well have given us a better experience than what we got in Shenmue 3. And I like Shenmue 3. It's a good solid 7 out of 10 game. But would it have given us a better, more story-rich experience? I don't know. I'd like to think it may have done. And I'd like to think that the, the, the community wouldn't have jumped on it and gone, do you know what? As long as we get kick our story, really well-detailed area like Dubuita that's really detailed, we you know, feel that world, then I think we'd have been happy. And, and, and in fairness to Bailu Village, it is a really good world. Yes, there's some the arcane things are a bit funny that being there but generally i had a really good time in bailu village it's one of my favorite areas in the whole shenmue series would the media have reacted the same way i do not know and internally did they feel that they had to they were bound by this kickstarter to give what the stretch goals were essentially talking about there is that question and i can understand where that would would have come from now, of course, there are going to be some circles who claim budget mismanagement, which feels a little extreme. And I would always ask people to go back to the Kickstarter promises and take that into consideration before they start claiming mismanagement. Scopes can change. You can make a cock up. And as money comes in, you change priorities, all the rest of it. I, I, It's difficult. It's really, really difficult. It seems to me they went down the road of, of the Kickstarter promises taking precedent over the other content, including the story. Was it the right move? That's hard to say. If Shenmue 4 takes the systems on, polishes them, and then absolutely smashes the story and gives us a 9 out of 10 game, um, we will be more than happy with what happened with Shenmue 3. We can look at it and go, all right, we understand it was there essentially to build the foundations like Shenmue 1 did for Shenmue 2 to give us that experience in Shenmue 4, which is amazing. And hopefully it will be. If developed in the traditional way, aka not tied to the Kickstarter, would they have had the flexibility to scale this project back and then give us that rich, detailed, really, really nice Bailu village with all that richness that a Dobuita may have and then really smash the story and then maybe have like a castle type um, ending to finish things off. Um, there's also another issue here in that the Shenmue 3 Kickstarter did gather a bit of dodgy press. Now, we know early on it came out that Sony were putting some money towards it. Gaming media ran off on that and said, I didn't need to fund fund this it's being funded by sony we know it wasn't in fact shibuya productions at the time were the highest um, private investor into it outside of the kickstarter so that damaged it and cedric when i spoke to him talked about basically saying i reckon we could have made 10 million dollars here well had they made 10 million dollars all of a sudden you've got sort of three to four million dollars more than you would have had um anyway so if you couple that into the shenmue 
three total budget, all of a sudden you're then sort of 23, 24 million dollars, which three to four million dollars doesn't sound like a lot in gaming terms, but when you've potentially got at least an extra 10, 20% budget, that could have been the difference between the story content being as rich as everything else in Shenmue 3 despite some of the lack of polish in, in areas. And maybe some of the, these areas would have been polished, like the fighting system and some of the mechanics may have been further polished. Who knows? I have one other question to raise, and this is an aside, but something I wanted to, to bring up is, should there be a Shenmue 3 post-mortem? So when you think of post-mortem, you think like the GDC 2014 stuff where they went through Shenmue 1 and 2, the development, all that sort of stuff. Should they do it with Shenmue 3? Yes, absolutely yes, because what it would do is put a lot of this conjuncture to rest. It would be a really interesting insight into how this thing was put together, the choices they had to make, why they made them, what decisions were made at what point, how the impact of the extra money from Deep Silver came in, the publisher, all of those sorts of things could be put to rest for good. And then they could maybe talk about potentially driving forward with Shenmue 4 and beyond that's just an aside point thank you guys for dropping in on what is going to be a near half hour video it's one of my longer ones probably the longest one i've done what do you guys think about the scope of shenmue 3 was it on balance too big for what they had drop us a comment in the youtube below i may well do a, a response video to some of the comments just to sort of talk things through and see how we go from there give us a like share subscribe on youtube facebook twitter twitch all the places that you can find us guys thank you so so much for joining in the content that james and i put together we appreciate it very very much and i will be back with another video in the not too distant future but for now guys take care have a good one all the best